I'll give you a clap in a Okay. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Alejandro uh, Suarez Mascareño from the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias. And today I'm going to be presenting uh, the work we did on B1298 uh, Tau, which was a very interesting and difficult work. For those not familiar, B1298 Tau, it's a very giant star. It's a, a solar mass, big, bigger than solar mass star, with just around 20 million years old, and a rotation period of 2.9 days, more or less, with some hints of differential rotation. And what makes it interesting is that it has a four planet system with two Neptune sized system and two approximately Jupiter sized system. This is a um, this was going to be a very nice animation, but I chickened out with the connectivity <laughs> problems. <laughs> <laughs> They were detecting in the K2 data. The K2 data of this star looks something like this, where you can basically already see the rotation very clearly. You can also see that there are probably two groups of, sp two groups of spots, mostly by eye. And it's one of those cases where also the transits are a bit hard to get from the, from the raw data. But once you do the feed with Gaussian processes and everything, you get something like this, which is much nicer with the four planets. Um, the letters are not the numbers of the planets. Are, that's from the nature paper. But the first one is B98 Tau B, which is a Jupiter-sized planet around 24 days period. Then C and D, the two Neptunes, and B1298 Tau E, which is another Jupiter-sized planet, which in the K2 data was just a monotransit. Now we have two right now. And uh, following a comment, I think it was by uh, Susan. Uh, this is one of those cases where the Gaussian processes with the transit start to have uh, a few issues. And it's not absolutely trivial because the stellar variations are huge compared to the transit depths. And sometimes, and I think it happened in the first paper they did about this, the Gaussian process can easily overfit the transits and you see nothing. Uh, what, but the point of this is what makes this very interesting is that it has 20 million years. At this stage, the planets are supposed to be contracting because young planets, when they form, are supposed to be huge and uh, very light. And then with time, they contract. And already with the discovery paper, they found a very, they already concluded something quite interesting, and is that they were, uh, these were uh, uh, smaller than expected. They were expecting to find either like 1.5 to 2 Jupiter radii, something like that, or much smaller, but they didn't expect to have already something like Jupiter and something like Neptune. So we attempted to measure the masses in this case, which was a, an absolutely insane project, because we started like just getting scraps of data here and there because we didn't actually have a project. Then we started building some collaborations. And in the end, we get something like this, which is 250 measurements in a, this part is a period of three months, in which you have first the activity signal, which is basically a peak-to-peak -peak of larger than a kilometer per second, and the green lines were the expectation that we had on the combined pull of all planets when both were pulling in the same direction. So already when we were planning this, we were, we were expecting this to be very interesting. And, oh, by the way, the velocities here were also measured with Serval, and uh, some of them were the CCF because we didn't have any compatible software for that. And this is probably something that can be improved, as we saw in the previous talk. And I really, really would like to test something like with what we saw in this data set. What instrument is here? Uh, a Stella shell spectrograph. Ah, okay. It's a uh, shell spectrograph in a one meter telescope, non-stabilized. Then uh, 
we wanted some nice activity indicators because uh, calcium H and K, H alpha, and these kind of indicators were kind of a mess in the first data that we had. So we did a long base campaign that you have here. And this is what then we use to guide our Gaussian process. The first thing I want to show is the, these periodograms, which are the radio velocity and the flux. And the, uh, we've been talking about harmonic complexity for a while, and there it is. In the flux, the main peak by a huge difference is the rotation, and you have some power at half the rotation. In the velocity, rotation is the main one, but you have the two harmonics very clearly there. And then, when you do the correlations between the flux and the radial velocities, you get that fantastic heart shape correlation. That's velocity versus uh, flux. It's already in the, done in the model because we didn't have exactly um, a simultaneous photometry. But then, when you do the derivative, it's linear. What a surprise. We've been also seeing things like that for a while. So then we started testing what would be a good model for this. And we tested kind of quite a few kernels. Uh, some of them were higher in the paper described. Some of them I kept testing this because probably I hate myself and I'm trying to look when this fails. And uh, we basically tested the model, all of them against each other, and uh, calculated the basic evidence. And we concluded that in our model, the best kernel was this. That's a formula basically copied and very slightly modified, just added a new term from the original Celerite uh, paper, and it seemed to work really well in this case. So we attempted a fit that was basically the K2 data. In that one, we used um, the rotation kernel also in Celerite, not this one, and then radial velocity and uh, uh, photometry with this one. And the first thing that I really liked when I, when I saw these plots is that you start to see that at the long term uh, modulation is basically, it's very similar. Even by eye, you can see that velocity is more or less following the photometry there. And if you look at them in a like you do a sum of this model, it looks kind of like this. The, in the photometry, you have basically your modulation, you have some distortion, which is what is given you, the power of the, of the harmonic. And in the velocity, you basically have a bump in the middle of each rotation, which was one of the motivations to try to use some kernel that was explicitly using the two modes. And... Uh, Can I just... Ask because it helps to follow. Sorry to interrupt. When you say you do the joint fit, is this a joint fit where the function explaining the different time series is the same, or joint in the sense that they share hyperparameters? But they share hyperparameters. We were not yet there uh, when we did this. That's fine. I just wanted to. Be... And one thing I would like to highlight here is that if you try to do this kind of stars, the sampling it's uh, it's it's crucial. During some of the campaign, we had kind of low cadence sampling, and we got to a few days where we, we were unlucky enough that we got like one point here, one point here, one point here, one point here. <laughs> and we were like, what's going on? Why is this flat? <laughs> then, if you face fold it uh, with the period that we measured, you have here the, the rotation and the radio velocity, which it's much nicer than I expected. But this kind of only works if you do like three, four months of data. If you go to the next year, we have some data and it's a complete mess. But uh, with our data set, it looks really nice. And you can see the bump of the, at the harmonic of the half the period showing really, really nicely. Then from this same model, this would be our planetary components for the fits we got for the four planets, although I will need to put an asterisk on that a bit later. You can see that basically the combined uh, signal, it's a peak to peak of around 200 meters per second, and then we get our residuals that are extremely instrumental dependent, 
which is another point that I would like to emphasize is that it doesn't matter if this is very active, this A9 is huge. You want the good spectrographs. Everything else is bad. You want a spectrograph that is good. <laughs> <laughs> then, <laughs> for, this would be the fits we got for the planets. And uh, for planet B, we got an amplitude of around 40 meters per second. We will be like two thirds of uh, Jupiter mass, more or less. And for planet E, we got a period of 40 days, uh, what will be a mass of more than one Jupiter, but that period came entirely from the radial velocities because it was just one transit. We had the phase, but not the period. And uh, this was basically uh, the star stabbed us in the back later. Uh, this will be the signals for the other two planets where we could measure just an upper limit. It's basically flat, and we can only know that it's, uh, they are not too big. And uh, we tested that they, uh, yeah, we tested that it was stable, it was very nice result. And when you compare them, that's one of the most insane things is that we are getting to a point in which maybe we can measure like things like this among noise like that, and that's absolute madness. <laughs> and I think we are only just getting there. We are probably going to be much better than this in the future. The caveat, it's what happens with that planet E that we measure only from radial velocity that it should have transit here. And it never happened. We were really, really sad about that. But uh, in principle, we are still trying to look for it. We have done some photometric campaigns and some more radial velocities. We are not sure if uh, the signal that we got there was actually caused by the planet, a harmonic of the signal of the planet, or more, radial, or more stellar activity which is also one of the dangers of getting into this kind of business. Am I reading it right that there is a planet E transit? Oh yeah, there's one. And now that we have two transits, we have like this array of possible periods. And if you get the close, if you get, if the period was exactly what we measured, there should have been a transit there. So if we believe that like this is actually the most likely we were right within two to three sigma. If it's not actually more likely, we were wrong about that planet, which it, I guess it happens because at least the model for planet B is not very dependent of, of this. We get the same masses if we remove this planet from the equation. But again, we were sad. We really liked to have two planets. <clears throat> well, then if we put the measurements here, let's please focus on planet B, which is the one that we think we actually get. But it will be basically something exactly between Saturn and, uh, and Jupiter. Depending a bit on the activity model, it, it moves a bit around there, but it's more most of the time in this region. And that would mean that a 20 million year old, it's already like the planets of the solar system, which is not the prediction from the formation models. The formation models would expect them to be like up there. And there are some, some formation models that could explain the 20 million years that they really need absolutely crazy uh, metal content in the core, like huge cores that if then the typical contraction model supply would eventually move the planet like here in a place where we don't know any planets. So we don't think that's a reasonable scenario, but uh, well, we are just getting into this jump planet system. So now I think, yes, I'm going to get into my part one of my summary because it's a very long summary <laughs> and it's that we think we managed to measure the mass of B1298 tau b at 0.6 Jupiter masses, which would mean it looks like an old planet, not like a young planet, which it kind of breaks a bit, a bunch of things out there. There is a possible measurement of B1298 tau, but that's, uh, that's a bit more uh, fishy. That's 
we are not sure of what that signal actually is. <laughs> then, uh, jump starts are a mess. I really had a hard time doing this. <laughs> so, I advise you to just not do them, but you are going to do them. <laughs> so, <laughs> don't underestimate the sampling. The sampling is key. You need, you really, really want your rotation signal that it's going to be short to be well characterized because it might be not very sinusoidal and not very well behaved. Uh, get photometry if you can. Like investing in a photometric follow up, if you can do even higher cadence than the radial velocity, it's always a good investment. And don't get fooled by the precision limit imposed by the BSINI. You don't want issues in the spectrograph to be part of the equation when you are working on this. You have enough problems with the activity of the star. And then also, if you can use the same spectrograph, because if you need to mix a bunch of them, it complicates everything because these stars uh, they showed significant chromatic variations between spectrographs and it's not the same to have a 10 to 20 percent when it's one meter per second than when it's a kilometer per second that changes everything completely and then a very a small experiment that we did was some uh, planet injection in our data like generating just uh, activity and injecting the planets at the periods that we did. And uh, we found that the different kernels that we tested behaved differently and they gave us different biases. In principle, well, the one that we selected was the one that was giving us less biases. But this gets me to the idea that not all kernels are the same and it's an important choice which kernel you use for your for your uh, problem. And I'm not sure we as a community have under control exactly how each kernel affects or biases the parameters of the planets, not the stellar parameters, but the planetary parameters, in particular when you are going into the noise level. And this is my last idea I wanted to, to send. I really enjoyed that talk. So questions, I see hands popping up. Oscar? Yes, uh, thank you for the talk. It's really good. Uh, what you mentioned is like when you combine the spectrographs, it's really complicated. Uh, but I noticed that I have done this with different optical spectrographs and it looks like everything works well. But I see that you're putting like Carmenes with optical instruments. And... Well, it's oh, Carmenes visible. Ah, okay. Because Carmenes infrared was horrible. Yeah, so, you, you <laughs> so you didn't try to combine infrared with the... Uh, we tried and uh, we were... No, I mean, I really love Carmen, but the data was a mess. And I really tried to put it, but it, it was just giving me more noise in absolutely everywhere. Okay. And... Do you know why? Uh, is, it, is it more instrumental because infrared is complicated or is it more due to the fact that you're probing some other things? I think... Uh, one of the biggest problems is the treatment of the tellurics, that it basically removes 70% of the wavelength range or something like that. It's very conservative treatment and it lets it, it just removes your signal to noise. We were having like twice the error bars in, uh, or three times, more than three times in the infrared. Okay, thank you. Okay, other questions? Uh, let's start with David Hogg, and then we'll come back. Uh, very, I, I really like your comment that it's very valuable in these systems in particular to have photometry, and I'm just wondering how easy is the photometry? What's, what kind of photometric amplitudes and what are the best fan passes? Okay, let me see. The, pho the photometric amplitude was like, I think, well, here it is, like 120 parts, uh, it's parts per thousand. So it's still... It's still it's, it's it's it requires good. You can't just throw crap at it. You I think this was done with the Las Cumbres four meters. Oh, that was done from the ground. That yes. was done from the ground. Yes. Okay, good. Great. Uh, it's a magnitude ten star. I think I didn't say that. Fine. So if we go find there, it might be more difficult. But for this, I think this is this might be that even something like this, the sampling. I was not entirely happy about that 
because if you go to the K2, uh, let me go back. Uh, it's pretty long. Yeah, K2, you get all these peaks mm -hmm. here and there that you lose with the ground-based photometry, but we yes. didn't manage to get higher frequency. And do you have a sense of what band passes are the best band passes for this? Um, I think... I think that's a huge question. Yes, of course yes. it involves observing <clears throat> conditions. Uh, no, no, but we have multi-band photometry that it was just taken later for a later campaign. And uh, I would say that if you want activity, B-band is the best. B, B. Yeah. Because B, uh, we had a lot of complications with that one. The amplitude is larger, but it was more noisy, everything. Okay. Oh, lots of questions. I know that this was... Oh, it's actually it's, uh, online. It's uh, online. Almost okay. like, um, we have Nudo Santos asking, as you know very well, Espresso, and also from Vital, um, FWHM is at least as good as, photo uh, as photometry. And what do you still consider photometry as mandatory? Uh, in this case? Um, I would say that unless you manage to get better sampling with the, with the radial velocity than the photometry, yes, and it's usually get, with our photometry we were aiming to a point every eight hours using the Las Cumbres network and uh, maybe if we do like a large proposal we can get one every four hours, something like that. I don't think you can ever do that with Espresso or something like that. And also the Visainai is definitely not the same here. As yeah, as yeah, as I don't know exactly how it will behave in, uh, in the other one, but, but the sampling thing, I think it's key always. And not even with like a, uh, with Harps North, we could have a point every eight hours. Basically the day doesn't let you. Okay, one in the back. Great. Uh, this is a great, wonderful talk. I'm, this is super exciting stuff. I'm very curious about the simultaneity of your photometric. I think I might have missed it. You have K2 data, and then you did an LCO campaign. Ah, uh, yeah, the K2 data. It's 2015. Okay. And then this uh, this is the Christmas of 2019 to 2020. Okay. Right. And the photometry happened here. Exactly. I see. Okay. So you you have the LCO coverage is fully symmetric, like simultaneous. Yes, yes. Simultaneous. It's not exactly like a point in radial velocity, right, it's but point in photometry, but it's exactly the time the same. zone is so you're capturing that like high frequency variation yes. and then the behavior from the so why do you use the K2 photometry? I'm guess, I'm curious. You said um because we saw that the first it's a, a while ago, and if you do the Gaussian process analysis with the same kernel. You find a different period, a different time scale, in a different time scale of evolution, and if you go to the test data that came, it's a different period and a different time scale of evolution from the other two. So if you try to do like five years of these, be prepared to use like five independent kernels or something that can change period or something like that. Is the reason you have that forest because of those? Sorry, I'm asking in terms of in. A, the forest of possible periods was that because of the transits being from two different epochs? No, I mean here the transits are not involved. Yeah, but so I think that the forest in the velocities it's caused basically from these gaps that it's. No, no, I think, I think you meant the in a later planet slide. Planet e. In e, the harmonics. For planet E, the last. I think it was your last slide. Is it a single transit or two? Yeah. Trans but then why two transits? Okay, uh, I don't know which one do you meant. Uh, <laughs> go, go, go. go. Uh, one with okay. this transit. Ah, no. Yeah, that's because at that time you have one transit in 2015 and one in 2021. Yeah, there are like 100 or 200 periods. That good. Yes, good. Brad got Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how, do, like, how does the uh, mass of planet B e, change with the puzzle periods of planet E? Um, I haven't tested with different periods. I haven't tested it with and without. Yeah, yeah. Without, we are at like 0.55 to 0.60 with 0.65. It's not a big change. That's the thing that made me really happy. <laughs> I was expecting it to just go away. Okay, still loads of questions. Let's go this way and just we'll make <laughs> <laughs> so. 
We don't have a discussion on uh, junk planets. <laughs> we all have discussions. <laughs> Thank you. It's beautiful. Uh, it, and you mentioned that it's kind of painful to mix different instruments, but I think it is a point that we should be worried about in the context of this talk. I mean, the, the fact that it is hard yes. to combine information from different instruments and get consistent results is something that we should care about and be extremely worried about. Yes. I would expect it to be uh, to us to be able to validate the, the astrophysics from different instruments and, man, and consider these uh, points in the instrument as nuisance parameters, eventually. Uh, I think, I mean, I said it was like, it was painful because basically they have different responses, but you can get the work done. But going on from the future, if we ever want to get to like the, the Earth twin and maybe get to small mass young planets to see what's the evolution, we need instruments that play with each other better than the current ones at uh, software level, file formats levels. So you can basically plug and play them together. And I mean, one of the problems we have is that Stella doesn't have any tools to extract radial velocities. So in principle, that was a cross correlation with a specific mask. Hermes doesn't have anything. So we use a cross correlation just getting the cross correlation function from the half uh, pipeline and just putting it there with the other spectrographs. For the other two, we had Serval. And uh, we, we didn't have the expertise to build just one tool for all. And I think at some point we need it. As a community. And yes. Can I try another one? Please, can, can you yeah. please elaborate on the injection recovery test that you did? How you did and what you did? Oh, okay. Our basic idea was um, work basically on this because once if you get this uh, best fit, we used best fit to this that was actually not linear, it was a, a slightly higher order polynomial. We added some noise and then we compared it to the original data. Um, basically, we attem attempted to reproduce the same periodogram. You repeated the search. Entirely from scratch? Or? Uh, yes, it was exact. Uh, no, uh, we, did, we didn't do the simultaneous with K2. We just gave the periods as fixed because I don't know if you, if anyone noticed this thing here, but this was also not nice. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, for each model, it was kind of, well, this was like the fastest because the accelerated one was much faster than trying them with George and other kernels. Okay. Uh, following up on that, actually, you say that with different kernels we get uh, different uh, after parameters. Uh, with different kernels, I get different amplitudes because some kernels are more rigid than other. With the ones that get like basically the best fit, I get things that are consistent with each other, but very different uh, no uh, uncertainties and sometimes, for example. When I go uh, to the, where it is, this the combination of periodic GPs, I get some residuals that are huge because it's not flexible uh, at all. Um, just, just yesterday I was trying this too, just expecting that it will not kill my talk, and they didn't. I got some similar results than what I had. But uh, you can get uh, up to 20 to 30 percent differences in amplitudes depending on the kernel. But, but are they like two signal, three signal different, or are they compatible? And, and, the, no, the, for, and the other question is uh, how well can you validate a certain um, kernel model? When you do the model, the model comparison of the, of the different kernels, are there some um, big um, the, this one that we put here uh, had, uh, it's in, I don't remember the exact name, but the, the difference in Bayesian evidence was quite large already from the raw model with only activity and no planets, and it was better all the time. Some others, like for example the one with just periodic GPs, that was much worse. Most of them were somewhere in between, and honestly it was at a point where I am not completely convinced 
of the typical scales of the Bayesian evidence for this because we are just scratching into the uh, just digging into the noise uh, very deeply. But with the usual rules, you could in principle distinguish them. Problem is maybe we reach the limits of the usual rules and uh, we are just doing something that we shouldn't do. I have opinions about that like some days and some days I don't have. <laughs> <laughs> okay, further questions? Uh, Xavier? Uh, did you investigate the velocity that you are measuring in the blue and in the red and were you able to see chromaticity there? Uh, we yes, but for such large signal you could start to see something. Uh, we investigated that only in Carmenes because in the Harps data we didn't have enough signal to noise in the individual in the individual spectra to do like too many cuts in the spectrum. In the Carmenes data we saw things and they were not super intuitive because if we would well trust the trends we saw it was something like this going into the visible and high into the infrared. <laughs> and... Uh, not what you expect, just... No, the, no, the, it was not what we expected and we don't fully understand which part is stellar and which part is instrumental. Okay, Vincent, last question and then we move to the discussion. Yeah, I think you raised a great point on like the choice of kernels and how to put things in. And I don't know, I, I guess Hawk said yesterday that it's, it's a challenge in the Bayesian framework to select models or find out which ones are good. And Eric Ford will probably say it's not just in Bayesian framework. Um, but, but it's really a problem in the mass radius diagram, right? I mean, we've all put your data points on there with different kernels in different ways. And we don't even, you know, agree on how to pick the best ones for our own papers. You often just do something very, very vague. But, but to, the, to the question part, isn't it true that you, you raise the physical interest, like the planet formation, that this breaks, you know, this is not a young system. Isn't it actually only relevant what the radius is for that, for that part of the question? Isn't, isn't the, you know, the planet formation question only about the radius, not about the mass? Or, or am I misunderstanding that? No, it's about the mass-radius relationship. And the thing is, let me go so it's about the density, right? Yeah, it's the density, basically. The thing is that if this mass, the better in the other one, if this mass is correct, formation models would put it up here. If the radius is correct, then the, and the model is correct, then the mass would be like up here. It should have, should have been almost a zero. And non well, okay, but so that, that's my point, right? So if that, what you're saying is right, I mean, I understand also the mass, it's not just the radius, but what you're basically saying is for any reasonable mass anywhere close to what you're measuring, it doesn't matter what the mass is, it's already going to break the probation point, right? It's really the radius where it's truly sensitive to. Uh, yes, I, I mean... Uh, for anything reasonably like a Jupiter... For anything within like two to two and a half sigma of our measurement, it doesn't fit the, the models. Right, so that's not sensitive to the choice of GP kernel. Whatever you're going to choose, it's going to break the uh, formation. Uh, in this case, yes. Yes. If you want to go in detail, no, but on the broad sense, yes. Okay. All right, brilliant. Let's thank again.